Hi everyone, welcome to today's video on standardization and the maths guru rule. Now you're going to say the maths guru rule, you're naming rules after yourself now. Hey, it's a lot, lot snappier than the 68, 95 and 99.7% rule. That's, I mean, listen to it, 68, 95, 99.7% rule. I don't want to count the number of syllables in that. So if I refer to it as the maths guru rule, maybe I'm just taking a little bit of a liberty, but the rule, the 68 to 95, 99.7 rule is going to actually be relatively important for all the rest of this course. Now, this is a continuation of the other video I've just done on the normal distributions. If you haven't watched that, please, please, please do. Um, again, one of my best. I'm so proud of it. Once you've done that, come back and we'll talk about this video here. So yes, as I normally say behind me uh, and slightly ahead above my head is the idea that we're going to know by the end of this video what the 68, 99.7% uh, rule is, how to apply it to a learning context and what a standardized value is. Now standardized values are going to be used a lot, trust me, when we get to um, the next few sections and videos. Now to recap, we've already looked at the normal distribution. We know it has a nice bell curve. We know that it's centered around mu, which is our mean, and we know that it's split up into center deviations. What we're now gonna look at, interestingly, is the fact that we can now actually work out that because it's symmetrical, and because we can use a little bit of funky maths, we can work out what percentage of data lies between each of those standard deviations. And yes, you can already see it here. So moving the graph up, now this is very, very accurate. If I go back to the rule I said a moment ago, we called it the 68, 95, 99.7% rule. Now these are just approximations. If we look at our first two sections here, 34.1 plus 34.2 actually gives me 68.2%. Could you imagine adding these decimals in? 68.2, 95.4, 99.7% rule. Well, way too long. While that's 68.2, generally speaking, we use the value of 68. And what does that mean? It means that between one standard deviation, either side of my mean value, uh, my mean valuation, now value in houses, that one standard deviation, either side of my mean, has approximately 68% of my data in it. If I look at two standard deviations, either side of my mean, what we'll find is approximately 95% of my data is there. Now actually that 95% is really important to us in later chapters. And just for completeness, that three standard deviations are either side of that mean give me 99.7% of the data. Now, knowing these individual percentages, we can use them to find out probabilities later on and, and, and all sorts of interesting stuff, but that's rushing ahead. Well, experience has shown that the scores obtained on a commonly used IQ test can be assumed to be normally distributed with a mean of mu of 100 and a standard deviation sigma of 15. So I'm going to write that down. Mu is 100 and sigma equals 15. This information might be important to me. Approximately what percentage of the distribution lies within one, two, or three standard deviations of the mean? Now, interestingly, in this question, which has been taken from the Cambridge Essential textbooks, which is the textbook I'm actually using to teach my kids, um, this has nothing to do with mu and sigma. Because what it's saying is, what percentage of the distribution lies between one, two, and three standard deviations? Well, we've just done that. We know the rule is not, uh, 68, 95, 99.7. This one is between one standard deviation, that one is two standard deviations, and that one there is three standard deviations. So if I was gonna answer this, I would say that it would be 68% for one standard deviation, and 95% two standard deviations, and 99.7% for three standard deviations. I'm not imagining this video is gonna to be too long. Four minutes already, let's move on. Now, looking at this question here, it says, from example two, we know that 95% of the scores in the IQ distribution lie between 70 and 130. All right, again, this question has been taken from another one. That is in within two standard deviations of the mean. Now, I don't know what the rest of the question says, but I'm gonna give you one huge top tip now, and that's draw a diagram. If you don't feel that you need to draw diagrams for these things, I'm going to stress you really, really do. It is going to make your life so much easier and it'll make my life easier in later videos if you're used to drawing diagrams. So what I'm going to do is a quick sketch of a normal distribution. It's going to be quite big. So I'm going to do this down here and I know that my mean was 100. So I know my data is centered around that 100. And I remember that I've got three standard deviations on the right and three standard deviations on the left. And because I know that I have a standard deviation of 15, 
that means every single gap is 15 more. So I'm going to add on 15 here, 115, 130, and 145. And then I'm going to take 15 off. So it's going to give me 85, it's going to give me 70, and 55. So just to elaborate on all of this, we now know that 99.7% of my data lies between people who have test scores of 55 to 145. Now, that's not what the question wants. The question says 95%. So that's between two standard deviations of the mean, which is there. And as the question now rightly tells me, the data falls between 90, uh, 70 and 130. So now let's read the question. What percentage of scores are more than two standard deviations above or below the mean. So what percentage of scores? So what it's now saying is what percentage lies in this section here and what percentage lies in that section there? Well, they've actually told me that 95% of the scores lie between those two. So what percentage must lie? Uh, long question. Bearing in mind 100% of my scores must lie in that whole normal distribution, I'm going to take away 95% and lo and behold, I'm going to end up with 5%. Now again, you're going to say, why did you draw the diagram? It's trivial. Yeah, now it's trivial. Later on, it won't be. Now, standardized values are going to become incredibly important. They're otherwise known as Z scores. I want you to imagine there's a number of tests being performed in a school and uh, ask you how easy is it to compare results of those tests. So, for example, if one student got 75% and the other gets 85%, can you automatically say that the second student did better? Well, if you've said yes, and you might be nodding emphatically at this, or just fast forward it through altogether, then actually you've made a lot of assumptions. And what I say here is, you've assumed they may have sat the same test, You've assumed they sat the same test in the same subject. You've assumed they sat it in the same school. You've assumed the test had the same number of questions. And I suppose the point of it is, is how close to the top was the 85%? So just to put that into context, while this person, while this student here may have got 75%, if they were the top of their class with that 75%, and this 85% was the bottom of the class, then actually it all starts to throw questions into this. So we need to have a way of comparing results across all subjects. Now, because it's across all subjects, each individual test is going to have its own normal distribution. It's going to have its own bell curve, and each test is going to have its own mu and its own sigma. Now, if we've got 20 tests happening, if we've got 20 subjects in the school, and we're going to try and find out which student has actually done the best, then this is where these standardized scores come in. They actually allow us to make, as I say here, a much more meaningful comparison. Now, do you recognize this? And you're probably going to say, no, not really. Well, again, it's in the previous video. In the previous video, we came up with the formula that said for a normal distribution, not the standard normal distribution, for a normal distribution with uh, standard deviation sigma and uh, mean mu, we have e was a minus 0 0.5 to the x minus mu over sigma all squared. Well, hold on a moment. x minus mu over sigma, x minus mu over sigma. Whoa! Now, basically, from that previous video, what we've realized was that this x minus mu over sigma took my standard normal graph and turned it into a graph over here with a mu and a sigma related to what was in those brackets. So the great thing is I can now use that and turn my score that I've got for my current test back into my standard normal distribution, which has a mu of one, uh, sorry, a mu of zero and a sigma of one. Now, if I can turn all of those 20 different subjects in my school, so, so they all then relate back to that one standard normal distribution, then I can compare results. Whoa, this is awesome. So the important part from this is that this Z score is made up by X, which is a data value, minus the mean of the data divided by the standard deviation of that data. So we may then be able to, as I say, compare directly. I'm going to leave that for a second and just build up more slowly with some examples. And, and we're really nearing the end of this video. So let's take a few more examples out of the Cambridge Essentials textbook, which again, I'm still using to teach from. The heights of women are normally distributed with a mean of 160 and a standard deviation of eight. I'm not going to read the rest of the question because I know how important it's going to become later on 
to know this information. So I'm going to write 160. I'm going to split my graph into three sections, 168, 176, 184. And then I'm going to take away 8 from each of those, which gives me 152, 144, and 136. Okay, so what is the standardized value for the height of a woman who is 160? The standardized value, right, okay, so st standardized value, it said Z is equal to X minus mu all over sigma. Right, so let's just take from that information from the graph. We know that mu was 160. We know that sigma is 8. What is my X value? Well, that's the value that they're giving me. What is the standardized value for a woman who is 160 centimeters tall? That's my X value. So X value is 160. Do you see where I'm going here? Another ridiculously trivial example. Z is equal to X, 160 uh, minus 160 divided by 8, which is 0 divided by 8, which just so happens to be 0. So, wow, what does that actually mean? Well, the standardized score there of zero basically tells me she is on the mean. We've turned this 160 back and matched it against my standardized scores here of mu equals zero and sigma equals one. So there's one, two, three, and minus one, minus two, and minus three. And they are actually my Z scores there. So because she was 160, she set exactly on my median, uh, sorry, my mean line there. And as such, she has to sit on zero for my standardized one as well. So a really, really trivial one. But this graph here is really important. We think of these Z scores as being one, two, and three, and minus one, minus two, and minus three. Why? Well, because they are my standard deviations. We know that my Z, uh, my standard normal distribution is centered around zero with standard deviations of one. So a Z score of one means a one standard deviation away from my mean of a standard normal distribution. I keep going on about this, don't I? I just really want you to understand it. Let's move on to the next one. The scores obtained on an IQ test can be assumed to be normally distributed with a mean of mu equals 100 and sigma is equal to 15. What percentage of scores lie above 115? Now I'm going to draw my graph. So 100, and then what do we have here? 115. Well, that was nice and easy, because I haven't done the rest of my data. Now, I suppose it goes back to the idea now, do we understand percentages? We want to be know what percentage lies above 115. So we need to know what percentage of data that is. Right. Well, to be able to do that, I know that because this value here is my mean, that is cutting my data directly down the middle because it always happens to be the medium, which means that I have 50% of my data on that side there. And from my graph above, and sorry for the quick scroll, I knew that in this section here, there was 34%. I'm going to ignore the one. I'm going to say 34%. And so making this 34%. Add those two together, it gives me 84%. That's not the answer I need, so I'm going to take 100 away from 84, and that leaves me with 16%. So the answer to that question would be 16%. I'm sure there are other ways of working it out. Again, going back to this example here, I could have done 13.6 plus 2 plus 0 0.1. Again, they are horribly, horribly accurate, and that seems stupid in math, doesn't it? And actually, this is the last question. This is this one about comparing scores. This is where Z scores become really important. My cool scores, 85 on a mathematics section of a scholastic aptitude test, the results of which are known to be normally distributed. Great, they've told me that it's normally distributed. Right, so what have we got here? We've got a mean of 78, and we've got a standard deviation of 5. So that's for Michael. And you got 85. Right, we'll leave that one there. Uh, Cheryl sits for a different mathematics ability test and scores 27. Well, automatically, I'm going, nah, she's done really badly. Michael's got 85, he must be doing better. But don't. That's not judge for a start. All right. Uh, the scores for her test are normally distributed again, thank you, with a mean of 18. Ah, oh, hold on, she's got a much lower mean. Mean of 18 and a standard deviation of 6. Uh, assuming that both tests measure the same kind of ability, who has the better score? So this was Cheryl. 
And what did she got? She got 27. Now, the only way I'm going to compare these is use z-scores. So, Michael's z-score is given by x minus mu over sigma. Michael's actual score was 85, which we want to standardize by taking away 78 and dividing it by 5, which I'll fire up my calculator in a moment or work those out. Cheryl's z-score is given by, once again, x minus mu over sigma, which gives me uh, her actual score was 27 minus the mean of 18 divided by 6. So I'm going to fire up my calculator and let's work out what these are. Uh, we've got 85 minus 78 divided by 5. So that gives Michael a z-score of 1.4. And let's go back to Cheryl's, which is uh, 27 minus 18 divided by 6, which gives 1.5. So who did better? Well, let's go back to this idea of z-scores. We know that for a standard normal distribution, which that is nothing like, wow, drawing these is really hard. Uh, we know that mean is zero. We know that the first standard deviation is one, the second is two, and the third one is three. Well, Michael got 1.4, so that puts him here, but Cheryl, got 1.5. Go Cheryl. So what it actually means is by comparing his Z, uh, their Z scores, we found out that Cheryl, because she got a higher Z score, which put her more to the end of the bell curve, she actually did better. This standardization stuff is absolutely awesome. The important thing is to make sure that you understand that table, copy it out, put it into your summary book, I know, memorize it, do what you need to do. But if not, you can always create it from that 68 to 95, 99.7 rule. Ladies and gentlemen, I am done. I said this would be a short video and it's still long. I talk too much. Um, thank you very much for watching. Um, have you subscribed yet? Uh, no? Uh, if you wouldn't mind, uh, subscribing there would be great. Uh, and if not, hey, maybe next time. It's been really good having you here. Uh, there's a video loading over there. If you'd like to watch another one, um, they're, they're quite interesting. I I'm trying my best. Um, but otherwise, you have an absolutely awesome day. See you again.